the Abundant Mars Podcast. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for man. The Abundant Mars Podcast. Civilization advances by extending the number of operations we can perform without thinking about them. Alfred North Whitehead. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, or good flight, potential Martians. I'm Michael Kubler, the host of this podcast. It's Tuesday, the 2nd of January, 2024, and I'll be discussing how we could create an abundant centered society on Mars. This is the first in a three part series, which will likely be my most important episodes. It's the reason I started the podcast in the first place. As today, I'll be talking about the Tower of Aces, which are 10 plus 2 points to live by. You can listen to the Abundant Mars podcast episode 1 if you want a more in-depth overview of an abundant centred society and why it's an ideal economic and social system compared to capitalism or a number of alternative economic systems. The core of an abundant centred society is based around access abundance, systems design, automation, and especially cradle-to-cradle style closed-loop material flows. Access abundance is about having community access be the default, not private ownership. Systems design is as you expect. It's about having a focus on building the systems that support us. Automation is about using robots, AI, and how we've built systems so we don't need to do menial jobs. Closed-loop material flows, also known as the circular economy, or cradle-to-cradle, is about separating biological and technical nutrients. It's about building things to last and then be upcycled into something new after its end of life. Or, if it's a biological material, then it should be bionutritional and good for the environment. Listen to episode 2 if you aren't sure why we should be going to Mars. It's mostly in order to make life multiplanetary, but it's also because it's an interesting challenge which could help spark fresh innovation. A common complaint is that we shouldn't be going to another planet as we are just going to trash it like we are trashing Earth. This is epitomised by Agent Smith in The Matrix describing humanity as a virus. Yet humanity doesn't need to be considered a virus. It's our profit-based monetary incentive which sees damage to the environment and other people as an externality. We will need to change how we do pretty much everything. But if we are living in an abundant centred society, then we should be actively helping the biosphere, not destroying it. The episode also goes more into the technical challenges of how we can cope with the harsh reality of living on Mars. Such as dealing with the freezing cold temperatures, thin atmosphere, dangerous cosmic radiation, and more. SpaceX and possibly other companies can build us the rockets to get to Mars, and that alone is an amazing technical feat. But living on Mars is going to be an epic challenge, one that will also require us to rethink how we live our lives. Once there's thousands of people on Mars, we also need more than just a list of tasks for people to do. We need a culture there. The default would be to export our existing culture. However, existing capitalism won't work on Mars. There's no cheap labour force, no environment to degrade, you can't treat people badly, and have massive inequality. It's too easy for mistreated people to destroy the Martian base and society. It's also such a harsh environment that you need automation. You need robots to do the bulk of the work, especially outside. You are creating new systems all the time and need them to work with the other systems. So you need a systems thinking focus. It's sometimes over a 40 minute round trip delay for signals from Earth. So you can't just rely on someone from Earth to guide you through fixing something. It's also two years between physical trips. You can't just order a technician to come out and fix the dishwasher when it's broken, which is likely given the gravity is only 38% that of Earth's. 
You need to be able to fix, improve upon, and create nearly everything that's sent to Mars. It needs to be an open source society. You also need people working collaboratively. Under a capitalist system, you would end up with five competing companies providing internet, maybe 15 different power companies, and even more groups fighting over who owns accommodation. You wouldn't want such organizations working in proprietary, garden world ways, intentionally not interconnecting with similar products. You might not have Wi Fi access simply because you are with the wrong provider. That's the sort of thing bad movies are made from. When you are living in an abundant centered society, whereby there's enough closed loop material flows and access abundance, you no longer have a need for money anymore. It's a post scarcity, post monetary system. With so many things changing, you need a new culture and mindset. What would you consider in regards to building such a new culture from the ground up? I've been thinking about this for some years, and that's why this episode is about the Tower of Aces, a set of 10 plus 2 principles I recommend for people living in an abundant centered society. The principles are ways of thinking which can help people know how to make decisions and navigate society. They aren't complete. I can't possibly guess everything that's required. We haven't got a working abundant centered society yet, so we can't iterate on these. Thus, these are just an initial proposed set, up for working and debate. Almost none of these are my own concepts. They are just ones that I feel would have a great place in an abundance-centered society. The Tower of Aces. Here's just the quick version. Number one, an abundance mindset. Creating abundance through cradle-to-cradle -cradle systems design, access abundance, and automation. Number two, responsibility-based you should look after the systems that support you and your fellows. Number three, reduction target. Try to reduce needless violence, waste and stratification. Number four, the scientific method. We want to pursue abundant knowledge, but apply it ethically. Number five, dynamic equilibrium. We should expect change just as our universe is always changing. Number six, dataism. With enough data, we can have previous examples to go on and select the best course of action, even if it goes against our instincts and emotions. This is the next stage beyond humanism. Number seven, integral. This is about understanding yourself and how to reason in order to increase your personal sense making. This includes psychometric profiling systems like the ocean model and spiral dynamics integral. Number eight, intelligence quadrant. Try to be in the intelligence quadrant whereby you do things that are good for you and good for others. Number nine, collective sense making. This is about taking your perspectives and merging them with others to better understand an issue. It's also about trying to expand empathy towards all living beings. Number 10, Collective decision making. This is about selecting the best decision making framework and synthesizing the best decisions given the constraints. Number 11 and 12 are bonus towels for you to work out, either individually or collectively in the future. So I've just defined 10 here at the moment. A towel is the art or skill of doing something in harmony with the essential nature of the thing. It translates from Chinese as the way or the path and can also be considered the unconditional and unknowable source and guiding principle of all reality. I'm sure some of you are thinking of the TV show The Mandalorian and This is the way. This is the way. Although what comes to my mind is the Tower of Backup, a great microsite with the basic principles of backing up data. To give you an example, the five tower of backup principles are broadly number one, coverage, back up everything you can. Number two, frequency, back up whenever you've done work or made changes, probably daily. Number three, 
separation, you should have at least three copies of your data spread across at least two locations. Number four, history. Keep old versions of your files, especially in the case that they become corrupt or you end up with incomplete backups. Number five, testing. Test your backups so you know that if you have to use them, they will work. Unfortunately, the Tower of Aces is a lot more complicated, but so are the rules we live by in our current Western society. Before I go into full detail about the first three Tower of Aces, I want to explain at least some of the existing culture and principles we live by in Western society. As the saying goes about fish living in water, they spend all their life in it, so don't perceive it. I don't think that's actually the case. They know of air bubbles and the surface. But I do think that understanding our current system a little more can help you see how we are already living by certain maxims which were created by us and which can be changed or were adapted from biological urges. If you want to know about the technical issues with capitalism, then I highly recommend Peter Joseph's movies and presentations, or especially his Revolution Now podcast, where he goes into great detail about the issues with capitalism. My focus here is on some of the seemingly hidden principles we abide by without really thinking much about. The culture under capitalism. Number one. There's a hidden pyramid hierarchy where violence is only allowed to flow down it, not up. Number two, the cultural definition of success is about monetary and material wealth, power, control, and fame. Number three is the rules for rulers, which are a set of key rules you need to follow in order to get and stay in power. These rules are that you should keep the key supporters on your side, you should control the treasure, and you should minimize key supporters. In this episode, I'll just explain the pyramid hierarchy. I'll explain the other cultural points in the next episodes. So, the pyramid hierarchy. Humans are very social creatures. Without living in groups, we can't thrive as a species. As such, a large part of our brain and our learning is dedicated towards living in social systems. As part of that, we have a built-in mechanism for determining a status hierarchy. People higher up in status are generally higher up in a pyramid structure we individually generate in our minds. The issue is that, especially under capitalism, someone higher up in the pyramid is able to cause violence to flow down the pyramid. But we generally get upset if it flows upwards. For example, if a police officer hurts a homeless person, that's unlikely to make the news because it's violence flowing downwards. But if a homeless person kills a police officer, then it'll be a travesty. That's violence flowing upwards. If it turned out that the homeless person was a war veteran, that makes it harder because people aren't sure where in the hierarchy the war vet is. If it also turned out the police officer was corrupt or something even worse, like a pedophile, then they'll be dropped down the hierarchy to be classified as a criminal and the homeless person could be considered somewhat of a hero by some. Depending on who you are and where you live, you might consider the pyramid layers from bottom to top to be comprised of criminals, homeless people, people not like you, people more like you, police officers, politicians, rich people, and maybe the president or prime minister of the country, and then probably the president of USA as part of the top tier. We are almost always subconsciously evaluating where ourselves and other people are in the hierarchy. However, the hierarchy can change drastically depending on the context. The one I just explained is mostly based on the cultural definition of success, that of power, wealth, control, and fame. But it's different, for example, in a family context, like at home. If we are setting the table, then as the primary earner for the family, I'm often considered to be at the head of the table. Although that's not my favourite spot, so that's not where I sit. 
Because of my skills in programming and entrepreneurship, I'm currently the technical co-founder of a SaaS platform. When it comes to the technical side of things, I'm at the top of the hierarchy. But my co-founder is the product manager and the reason we have the money to develop the software. So whilst partners, he's still a half step above me. Contexts can change drastically and the movie Triangle of Sadness shows this really well. Some spoilers ahead for the movie. There's a lot of rich people on a quarter of a billion dollar large cruise ship and they're seen as an authority nearly that of the captains. Below the captain and multi-millionaire passengers is the first officer, the head of staff and down to the lowest janitor. Things go bad, the boat sinks, People end up stranded on an island and quickly are running out of food. Of course, the millionaires have no good survival skills on the island. Thankfully, the toilet manager, an old Filipino woman, knows how to make a fire, catch fish and octopus, clean and cook them, and becomes the main provider. Suddenly, she's now the most important person and she asserts herself at the top of the pyramid. She's now able to get respect and order things from others she normally wouldn't be able to. It's a great movie that shows the change in status and hierarchy very well, but also hints at the depths some people will go to in order to keep their status. There's a lot more to our current dominant civilization. I could go into detail about behavioral economics, history, energy systems, complexity, and more. However, It's time to look to the future. Time now for the more detailed Tao of Aces. Instead of using money and pricing mechanisms, we need a different set of systems that influence how we work and what we work on. Instead of our current cultural definitions of success, we need something new. Whilst an abundance-centered society has some core aspects to the economics, I see the Tao as the main tenets of the culture. The list should consist of the fewest number of tenets whilst providing the decision-making processes and behaviours for the majority of morals, ethics and other things which should generally apply on personal, community and civilization wide scales. The current 10 plus 2 tenets I list here are just suggestions and will likely be part of a living document of sorts. No one currently lives in an abundance-centered society and will need to go through an iterative process of trying it out, seeing what works, what can be removed, shortened or replaced with something better. It shouldn't get too big. My suggestion is that you cap the number of tenants at 12. After that, if you want to add a new one, you have to remove one or merge some together. Many of these concepts are a part of the Zeitgeist Movement and Venus Project. However, some are new or being discussed in Game B and other adjacent groups. Tao 1. Abundance Mindset. Creating abundance through cradle-to-cradle systems design, access abundance and automation. An abundance-centered society is very similar to other proposed systems you might have heard of, like a post-scarcity society, zero marginal cost society, or a natural law resource-based economy. It recognizes that there will always be some forms of scarcity. For example, time, recognition, access to certain places and objects. However, the aim is to have access abundance and at least the necessities of life available for free to everyone on the planet. This includes air, water, food, shelter, electricity, transport, education, health, entertainment, and more. Beyond that, there are certain strategies which can dramatically increase the amount of abundance we experience, whilst also increasing our quality of life and the well-being of the ecosystem. Science and technology has provided us with incredible capabilities with which we can manipulate the environment. Unfortunately, we are doing it with disregard to the environmental costs. An abundance-centered society knows that it has to achieve that abundance whilst remaining within the carrying capacity of the planet, or whatever ecological system it is in, 
be it a spaceship, a gas giant, or a digital world. Access abundance and cradle to cradle are two important concepts used to increase both abundance and sustainability. Access abundance is about a sharing economy. You don't need to own a drill, you just want a hole in the wall. So you can borrow a drill from the local community toolshed when you need, instead of everyone having to buy one. Few people need to own a car, especially if they're simply better trains and public transport or maybe self-driving cars, meaning you never have to worry about parking again, nor washing, maintenance, and upgrades. In addition, you can enjoy your travel time by talking with friends, watching a movie, sleeping, listening to podcasts like this, and even more. Going for the cosmolocalism approach of heavy things being built close to you and light things being shared, it makes digital access especially easy. There's no need for a massive library of Blu-rays or DVDs in each home, given we can easily stream videos online. You also don't need a vacuum cleaner, but we still want to clean carpets and floors. Instead of 50 houses each having their own vacuum cleaner, there could be two really good industrial grade, self-healing, auto-recharging, robotic vacuum cleaners, which will come and clean your carpets. Now, you don't have to worry about it. Not only would that decrease the amount of resources being used by nearly a 50th, it will also increase people's quality of life. Of course, you can go a step further. With a systems design perspective, you can remove the need for vacuum cleaners by having hydrophobic carpets which automatically ripple the dirt to the edges. Cradle to Cradle is a systems design process of creating things with a closed loop material flow or life cycle in mind, ensuring things are either technical or biological nutrients. Items should be either bionutritional and thus short lived but good for the environment, or built to last but then able to be broken apart into their constituent elements so they can be reformed into new products with new uses. The tracking of these materials is known as the technical flow and is similar to the water cycle or the hydrogen cycle. We would track the titanium, copper, plastics, wood and all other such materials, allowing the materials we've mined to be reused again and again instead of just throwing them away. A true circular economy. The actual distribution of resources is likely best done using an algorithm or set of algorithms. I suggest having it based on a next generation distributed ledger system. If we're defining Bitcoin as the first generation and Ethereum as the second generation, you might say that IOTA is third gen and Hashgraph is fourth gen. Then a specifically generated fifth or sixth generation is likely what will be needed. Being a global distributed ledger system means that everyone can transparently see what algorithms are running what the calculations are, and how resources are being allocated where and why. Fully transparent, but also updatable. The late Mario Matiev called this the resource engine. This resource engine replaces the majority of politics with working out better algorithms. That said, local cultural requirements will likely also have an effect. An all-vegan city or completely anonymous town will be different from one trying to push the boundaries of technology. What happens if we are actually running out of copper? You can try mining for more, or we can look at where the material is being used and if there are alternatives which can replace it. As copper is being used in a lot of electrical cabling, we could progress with research into graphene or ceramic style superconducting materials and replace a lot of the power lines with superconducting ceramics or maybe some LK99 like material, whilst also reducing our energy loss. Issues likely manifest as individual, community, global, or universal challenges or projects, which people tackle as Tower Point 2, having a responsibility for the systems that support us. In an abundant centered society, there's a focus on automation and quality systems. 
so that there are fewer day-to-day -day tasks you need to deal with. You can still choose to go and garden, cook food, or clean your house, but you don't have to. You don't have to slave away working in order to survive financially. Although on Mars, there's likely going to be a lot of work to be done so everyone there can physically survive. It's expected that most people will want to choose a craft or occupation, something they can spend a decade mastering, be it painting or programming, dance or biology, something that you'll enjoy. Note that in an abundant centred society, instead of the focus being on capital, the focus is on reduced running costs, even if the initial resource and time investment is higher. Automation is a useful tool for reducing the needless suffering and increasing abundance, although on its own, it's not enough. But when paired with a systems redesign perspective, it can be incredibly powerful. An important part of having a systems design perspective is that you usually need to look at the core problem or start from first principles. I've found that this usually involves zooming out or zooming in your thinking to the appropriate level and looking at it from different perspectives. For example, if you are trying to automate supermarkets, your first thought might be to replace checkouts with self-serve checkout stations. But that's only changing who is doing the work. You could put RFID tags on all items and let them walk out, detecting what they are taking from the store, which saves the scanning step. Think about it though. Most people usually drive to the shopping centre, get out of the car, walk to the shop, walk around selecting products and put them in a trolley. Take the products out to scan them, repack the items, bring them to the car, put them in the boot of the car, drive them home, take them out of the car, plonk them on the kitchen table, and then distribute them around the house. That's a lot of effort. Analyze the core problem and zoom out to see the whole process from farm to fridge. People need stuff in their cupboards and food in their fridge. So especially on Mars, you would want to build a distribution system which does just that, delivering the items as needed directly into the cupboards and fridges. Maybe it uses little robots on rails which hold reusable Tupperware style containers, or maybe it uses drones. But the end result is that someone could be cooking dinner and by the time that they've finished cutting up and cooking the tomatoes, a new set have been delivered fresh from the local vertical farm. Another way of thinking about systems design is realising that often what is needed is a change in the defaults. For example, imagine you are in the city late at night and what you should have is good food available by default instead of fast but unhealthy food. Knowing when systems need refinement as opposed to a full redesign is important. And being ready to take on such challenges often means we need both imagination of what is possible and the application of the scientific method to know which is the best option to implement, which is covered in Tau number four on the scientific method. Tau number two, you have a responsibility to the systems that support you and your fellows. You have a responsibility to support the ecosystem, social systems and technical systems. The ecological system is nature, everything from the fauna, flora and geology. These help capture the sun's energy and convert it into a form that we can consume along with the life supporting nutrients we need and the entire web of life that comes along with such a system. The plants help convert our CO2 to oxygen and clean the air and the water. Animals help in a myriad of ways, from pollinizing to fertilizing. Even the bacteria in our gut help break down our food into the essential amino acids that we need. We need an ecosystem to survive, and we are a part of that, not at the top of some pyramid, but as part of a living cycle. Think about going to the store and buying some fruit. You might have already paid money for it, but you don't really own that apple. When you consume it, 
you use the life-supporting nutrients, but most of it will eventually pass through to the rest of the ecosystem. In an abundant centred society, you wouldn't buy the fruit as there's no longer a need for money, but instead you would now have a general responsibility to the tree that bore the fruit, the orchard it came from, and importantly, the entire ecosystem it and we are a part of. You might not be able to directly help that specific tree, but you can help the system in other ways based on your skills and capabilities. A form of paying it forward. The social and technical systems can be considered human-run subsystems inside of the ecosystem, but they have their own requirements. The technical systems are things like the production and use of goods and services. They include the chair you sit on, the phone or computer you use, the internet you access, and associated storage and computing power. Even the clothes you wear. When you think of IQ and what you can create, it's most likely applied to these. The social systems are our institutions, knowledge bases, ideologies, and ethics. Our culture, friends, and family. They include the governance structures and decision-making processes we use, and of course, these very tenants. These are usually more of the EQ-related things, generally about people and to a large extent, our emotions. Your responsibility includes supporting and developing these systems and refining or redesigning them if need be. In general, the aim is to design such systems without the need of much menial labour. Reducing the labour needed for general running and maintenance of the systems through automation, systems design or sometimes behaviour change. There's almost always going to be some manual maintenance required, but the aim is to reduce it, as per the tower number three, reduction target. People vary in a variety of ways. The most basic aspects being skills, capabilities and availability. Thus, the actual tasks done will vary from person to person. Likely drawn from a combination of both what their skills are what is considered important and urgent, or important but not yet urgent, plus what they are attracted to. People also have different work intensities and styles. Some might work every day for years, whereas others might spend decades levelling up and then invent something which removes the need for thousands of others to do such daily work. That said, as per Tao number 8 on being in the intelligence quadrant, if you're a bandit or a stupid person, which is someone who is consistently doing harm to others or themselves, if you end up in the lower quadrants, then maybe keep away from doing too much work until you've first resolved that and you aren't a detriment to society. As part of your responsibility to the systems, you should understand how to balance production versus production capacity. In a technical system, Production would be creating a new chair using a 3D printer, whilst production capacity would be about creating more 3D printers or possibly a mould of a chair for faster injection moulding production. For an engineer, production might be designing a new drone or writing software to help the drone fly better with less working rotors if there's an emergency. But production capacity is usually about personal recharge and recovery as well as increasing our personal capabilities. It might be that you spend three days working really hard, then have a couple of days off to relax and recharge. Or you might spend a couple of weeks on a training course or learning new systems. Another way of thinking about getting the right balance is about the need to find the right tension for a violin or a guitar string. Too tense or too slack and it won't sound right. It needs to be tuned just right, which is to say that over or underexerting yourself too much is detrimental to your physical and mental health, and thus your happiness. This is mostly because of our biology and our need to have some glucocorticoid stress hormones in order to even get up and be productive. But too much or too little stress can be crippling. It's a narrow range. Given we are changing the cultural definition of success, 
your status will be based more on a meritocracy. It's likely to revolve around how you are contributing to society. An example is that of two people. One helps a little old lady up the stairs every day. Another is an engineer called Elisha Otis who develops the safety elevator. Now, elevators around the earth are helping millions of people an hour move up and down. Other people might focus on powering such buildings and elevators with renewable energy and thus reduce the damage done to the environment and people's lungs from, say, coal power plants. Although, coal power plants aren't an option on Mars. Next, we just need musicians who can create better Muzak elevator music. Oh, and an Omnivator that can go anywhere in the Mars base? That would be really cool. Tower number three. Reducing needless violence, waste, and stratification. Violence. We should seek to minimize needless violence, be it direct or indirect, structural or ephemeral, physical, emotional, financial, or even intellectual violence. But mostly the focus should be on reducing destructive physical violence, be it fistfights or being stabbed or shot. We can never achieve zero suffering, at least not as biological entities. Our biology wired us to survive, not be blissfully happy, and there are forms of suffering that are important for our development, from physical or mental exercise to the suffering of a tree being blown in the wind to strengthen it. These things harden us and let us better cope with the realities of life in a complex universe. There is also certain types of creative destruction as part of the dynamic equilibrium process which we covered in Tower number 5. Despite humanity's advances and general reduction in violence in the last few hundred years, there is still a lot of needless suffering. As I record this, we have Russia trying to invade Ukraine, and Israel and Palestine at a much more intense level of fighting. One way of dealing with violence is, as Gary Slutkin explains in his TED Talk, we should be treating violence like a contagious disease. You don't want to inflict it or spread it. Think about it. If someone invades your country and kills your family and friends, are you going to grow up and be a doctor or a lawyer? Or are you suddenly going to change your mind and become a soldier or what the other side will call a terrorist? Or if you're growing up in a destitute neighborhood where dealing drugs and being in a gang are the easiest forms of employment, then it's going to be very hard to become a software developer or molecular biologist. As an example, if you're treating violence as an epidemic, then you want to interrupt transmission, prevent further spread, and change the group norms. If you are treating the gun violence in America, then you would, number one, interrupt transmission. You could do this by detecting the first cases. If it was COVID, you'd be swabbing people's nose for it. But if it's violence, it could be having people in the neighborhood notice when someone gets angry. Maybe they feel slighted by someone and want to go get some retribution. Number two, prevent further spread. Find people who are exposed but might not be spreading violence right now, like someone hanging out in the same group. Number three, changing group norms. If it was an epidemic, you'd increase hand washing or wearing PPE. But in this case, it's about shifting the norms so that violence as a response is reprehensible. Where doing a drive-by shooting because you think someone kissed your girlfriend isn't acceptable. You need community activities, education, and remodeling what good behaviors are. To help facilitate those steps, you end up with violence interrupters. These are people who signed up from the same groups, but are trained in persuasion and reframing. They're people who are good at cooling down others with heated emotions. You also have outreach workers, which are effectively putting people who are at risk or have caused violence on a treatment plan for 12 to 24 months to enact long-term behavior change instead of sending them to prison. You can put up signage and do local campaigns like tracking how long since the last shooting. But applying this on a country level, you start seeing how there are countries and people still fighting for problems which go back to World War II 
or even before. We will still need to have the equivalent of laws and ways of dealing with people who break them. However, as Dr. Robert Sapolsky explains, most people would do the same thing in that person's position. The best option of reducing violence is to reduce the need for it by ensuring adequate access to resources. So the best way of dealing with people who have stolen things, hurt others, or caused problems isn't to put them in prison. It's usually to rehabilitate them. If they are doing drugs and being irresponsible, then help them get out of the situation which is causing them to become so stressed and then help them get off the addiction. If they are prone to violent outbursts, then they'll likely need anger management training or possibly restraints. We currently treat mental health in a very negative light and we'll need to change that in the future. But I see the target reduction to be that towards a lower baseline like an asymptote. However, it's not going to hit zero because we want to increase our anti-fragility. Also, as per Karl Popper's famous quote, the paradox of tolerance. We should not tolerate the intolerant. We should strive to be able to tolerate many different environments, including cultural ones. This means we have to be able to cope with violence from humans, as well as the damage that can be caused from the environment. That's one of the main reasons I don't support victimhood culture, nor idea supremacists. As explained in What's Our Problem by Tim Urban, there's currently three main cultures. Dignity culture, honor culture, and victimhood culture. Dignity culture is like the Wild West. If someone calls you some words you don't like, then because you distrust authority, but are sensitive emotionally, you beat them up. If someone steals your stuff and beats up your family, then you bring justice using your own hands. Honor culture is the current prevailing culture, and if someone calls you words, you'd recite to yourself, sticks and stones will break my bones, but names will never hurt me. You try having a thick skin for people saying bad stuff about you. But if someone steals your stuff and beats up your family, then you go to the police and get justice. That said, you also attempt to use nonviolent communication. However, there's a growing trend of what Tim Urban calls social justice fundamentalists, which would see even tiny things as a slight, and instead of having thick skin and just taking it, they label it a microaggression and look to an authority to do something about it. If it's not a legal issue the police will handle, then they'll use support groups to have that person punished. This often means using cancel culture and turning everyone against that person, socially casting them out, which is very harming. Such SJF, or social justice fundamentalists, will even apply current social norms to what people said decades ago, which is why people like Guardians of the Galaxy director James Gunn was briefly cancelled for joke tweets he made over 10 years before. Even Martin Luther King was not openly for gay rights, as that wasn't within the Overton window at the time, and wasn't something he was pushing. These cultures explain as if in a schoolyard. Dignity culture. Bobby calls Johnny stupid. Johnny punches him back. Honor culture. Bobby calls Johnny stupid. Johnny says, I know you are, but what am I? Then walks away. Victimhood culture. Bobby calls Johnny stupid. Johnny runs to the teacher to tell on him and get Bobby in trouble. Of these three, being able to take some insults and having thick skin is important. It's the most tolerant, least violent, and most anti-fragile. Waste. Waste comes in a variety of forms, from material to thermal, energy, time, emotional, and mental. Most waste is actually just a form of energy or material for which we don't yet have a process of managing and putting back into the ecosystem. Within an abundant centred society, we live using the closed loop material system. As with the carbon and water cycles, we track the materials flow from metals and plastics to fibres and electronics. Items are designed to both be long lasting, easily repaired, and also able to be broken down into their constituent parts to be reused in new ways. 
Alternatively, they are designed to only last a short time, but are bionutritional and thus good for the environment. Instead of garbage bins in the park, there are signs saying, please litter here, because of the bionutritional packaging that's good for the environment. There's also the Tupperware economy, reusable containers that are part of an interconnected distribution system, in which case you would put the strong reusable containers into the appropriate bin-like receptacle for them to be taken away, cleaned and reused. In such a cradle-to-cradle system, nearly all material items can be repaired, reused, recycled or composted. However, there are still energy used in such processes and therefore we don't want to needlessly generate large amounts of waste. It's unlikely we'll ever be able to prevent the release of all thermal and other forms of waste energy from dispersing, as entropy is hard to stop. However, we shouldn't needlessly waste energy. The wasting of time and emotional and mental energies is likely one of the more interesting challenges. Note that we should definitely spend lots of mental energy processing our thoughts. We will have to go through lots of emotional turmoil in our lives and we will spend a lot of time doing seemingly little. But most of what people consider time wasters, such as computer games and TV shows, can provide positive benefits, even if they are simply entertainment or as a stress coping mechanism. There is, unfortunately, a large amount of needless bureaucracy and other actual wastes of time. Filling in of forms and applying for things can be an astounding waste of time. Most paperwork could be automated, simplified, or simply removed. Thankfully, in an abundant centred society, whilst we'll track resource usage, we can do that in a general and automated fashion. We don't need to require people to pay for everything, and it will dramatically reduce a lot of needless lineups and wasted time. Even simply having free Wi Fi means Internet of Things, IoT and lots of devices will be able to connect freely and easily, opening up whole new areas of possibilities. So, we've talked about violence and waste, now stratification. The reduction of needless stratification helps address the extremes of wealth and poverty, especially when paired with competition. These extremes often reduce our ability to innovate and be productive. The work by Richard G. Wilkinson and Kate Pickett in the book The Spirit Level, Why More Equal Societies Almost Always Do Better, explains this well. Social stratification is the hierarchical or vertical division of society, according to rank, caste or class. Humans have elements of both pair bonding and tournament alpha male systems. Thus, like many animals, we will automatically and nearly subconsciously rank people according to to different traits, be it dominance, intelligence, or skill at playing Mario Brothers. However, intentionally reducing access to required resources based on such ranking is something to be avoided, as it causes structural violence and reduces individuals' capabilities. Remember, people have different traits, and you shouldn't judge a fish for its ability to climb a tree. Most people can accept the difference of, say, three times between the richest and poorest. But the difference in income inequality between the richest 1% and the bottom 20% is at least 104 times as much. And CEO pay is 324 times that of worker pay as of 2021 in USA. Going back to the pyramid hierarchy, the less you earn, the lower down the pyramid that you are, and there's more psychosocial stress that occurs. This affects everyone from the second highest earner down to the lowest. This means that you can look at nearly any index like life expectancy, math and literacy, trust, social mobility, and they are all lower in countries with higher social stratification. Even in countries like USA or Australia, which have a high GDP per person, have worse measures than countries with a lower GDP per person but also less social stratification, like in Japan, Sweden and other Nordic countries, but even in countries like Spain. Looking at other stats, they can be higher and worse in countries with higher social stratification. 
Things like infant mortality, homicides, prison rates, teenage births, obesity, mental illness, drug and alcohol addiction, these are all worse social problems the higher the social stratification. Reduced social stratification helps everyone, the rich and poor alike, even if it does help the poor slightly more. Also, we all do better by us all doing better. You could be the 10th richest person on the planet, part of the 0.001% who may own more than their fair share. However, if you get sick, be it cancer or some rare disease, you will still die. But it's possible that someone currently in a developing country has had the education and has the right mental model to create a cure for ails you. But instead of researching and developing it, they are stuck doing menial tasks to pay off medical bills or student debt and aren't given the opportunities they need to explore that. But even people who are rather well off are still going to have reduced innovation, reduced health and other issues because they are comparing themselves to the richest people in the world. By the same token, I wouldn't want the life of Elon Musk, currently the richest person alive. When every minute of your time is measured in tens of thousands of dollars, and you run multiple businesses, it's hard to enjoy just spending time with your family, or even just resting. On the opposite end of the spectrum, the research shows money does buy happiness, but only up to a point. If you earn $120 a year, it's unlikely you'll even be able to buy enough water. At $1,200 a year, you are still destitute and living in poverty. At $12,000 a year, you might be living in a halfway house instead of a cardboard box, and you might even have a mobile phone. But at $120,000 a year, you can live with your spouse and family in a nice house. You have a car, go out traveling once or twice a year. So yeah, for $120,000 a year in countries like Australia or USA, if you earn more, you don't really increase your happiness. Instead, if you started earning $12 million a year, you would become more stressed. But your quality of life would not drastically improve, even if you think it would. In an abundance-centered society, you don't need to work in order to financially survive you will still want to contribute to society and the systems that support you and your fellows. So, the financial stresses will be replaced with other motivations. Reducing violence, waste and stratification towards zero, whilst having abundance, is what puts pressure on the systems to be changed, hopefully towards the good of all. Okay, so now time for a meta-analysis. I want to discuss why I've selected these Tau and why I think they're important, whilst also mentioning the good and bad points about them. Number one, an abundance mindset. Why is an abundance mindset important? Our current monetary system expects infinite growth, but we are living on a finite planet, and we are already hitting the limits of growth, and have overshot the carrying capacity of the Earth. Unfortunately, due to inertia, it's going to be hard to change. So an abundance-centered society is a new system which makes the existing model obsolete. Because there is no existing biosphere to make use of, capitalism wouldn't do well on Mars. Hence, getting aces working on Mars is a good first step. An abundance-centered society also tackles the current issues that our monetary-based system causes and allows us to reach a new stage of human development instead of having to regress. Whilst other alternative economic systems have been proposed, none tackle as many of the issues as an abundance-centred society. So the good aspects are that we'll have a stable system that's not actively destroying human well-being or the environment. We won't have to think of humans as a virus destroying everything. And we shouldn't be worried about having to build a bunker and trying to survive some sort of end of civilization. The downside to a cradle-to-cradle based system is that building things will be harder, or at least hard in a different way. Choose your hard. 
No longer will things be built to break down just after the warranty expires. Instead, they'll be built to last, but also using fewer different chemicals, especially shunning anything that's toxic to humans. For example, you wouldn't have a juice box anymore. Those usually contain six layers of paper, polyethylene, and aluminium foil. In an abundant scented society, you instead would have containers made of glass, metal, or plastic, not some crazy mismatch that's hard to recycle. Those containers would also be washed and reused many thousands of times, so things would be done differently. Access abundance also means getting rid of most private property. You still have personal property. Your underwear is yours to use, and so is your bed. But any materials from when you have grown out of them or moved on will be very well sterilized and unwoven into a new set of raw materials. Getting rid of money, private property and inheritance may be a bit of a mental leap for many people. Some may not be able to make the jump directly, but there are some alternative economic ideas floating around, like true cost economics, steady state economics, PearCon, and more, which could be used as a stepping stone. Because it's such a big leap, applying an abundant centered society to Earth will require a big change, moving the Overton window a long distance, changing what's considered acceptable in society. And this will take time. It's hoped that such a change will be easier for people going to Mars, as it'll be part of their training, and they'll have a seven-month trip to get used to it. Plus, it'll be a different environment that the existing norms just don't apply to. Meta-analysis on tower number two being responsibility-based. Why does this matter? Because we need something other than a monetary-based social system and hierarchy. The other options include things like meritocracy, but that's hard to quantify. And more of a disaster scenario is using woofy or sesame credit or some sort of social credit, where people rate others' behaviours. It was shown well in the Black Mirror TV show, Season 3, Episode 1, called Nosedive, with Bryce Dallas Howard playing as Lacey, who gets bad ratings from people and so can't fly to a friend's wedding, and instead ends up having to drive in a crappy car, has to walk, makes a fool of herself, and ends up with a rating so low she goes to jail. Or even better is the book Down and Out in the Magic Kingdom by Cory Doctorow, one of my favourite authors. The good side is a responsibility-based system means people are trying to look after each other and the system. Thus it should be inherently anti-fragile. It allows for a lot of different ways people can contribute, both individually and together. It helps for people to be in a flow state, where in the zone, where you're trying to do work that's just a bit above your current skill level. It's one of the most rewarding things people can be doing. The downside to a responsibility-based system is that it's somewhat vague and hard to quantify, although I'm sure people will try using systems like Copiosis's net benefit reward. The fact that it's hard to quantify is also a positive in that it should be hard to game the system using shortcuts. Whenever you focus on a particular metric, it's at the expense of others. So what else are we missing? Maybe there's a focus on exploration or family we could be doing instead of responsibility. It could and is unfortunately likely to be taken to the extreme. For example, just because there's systems out there that don't directly support us doesn't mean we should be actively destroying them. Thankfully, reducing violence should help counter some of these extremes. An abundance-centered society with a focus on automation and systems design, means there should be a lot less work for people. This is good, but the downside is that people might find themselves seeming to be a freeloader, not able to contribute to society very easily. It could take decades of education and personal development before people can make meaningful contributions. Now, the first few hundred thousand people on Mars are likely to be rather busy. 
but eventually there will be a time when people don't need to actively work to survive, which is perfectly fine. Except we have a built-in, possibly biological need to find and root out freeloaders who aren't contributing. And that's something we're going to need to contend with. Meta-analysis of tower number three, reduction target. Why is this important? Because we need to aim towards something, and these seem like good aims. The good points are, it's hard to argue that violence, waste and stratification are things that we should increase. We will be dramatically reducing the amount of material waste through a change to cradle to cradle closed loop material flows. With IoT sensors on nearly everything and a well-designed resource engine, we can do the required resource tracking without much bureaucracy. The bad side is we might find better targets in the future. There's certainly other positive and negative targets which could be better. Now, some people might think happiness is a good thing to aim towards, but you'll probably end up with a brave new world type of situation with people taking SOMA. Another example could be being in the flow as a target to increase. However, you can do that simply by playing computer games or gambling, things which aren't as beneficial to society. So instead of aiming for that directly, I expect that being in the flow state would be a useful indicator, not a target. Another bad point is we want to directly measure violence, waste and stratification. However, as per Goodhart's law, when a measure becomes a target, it ceases to be a good measure. Another issue is over-optimizing a system towards certain outcomes can cause issues with the system as a whole. We also don't want zero waste, zero stratification, nor even zero violence. Zero waste means there's no slack in the system. It would be very fragile. It would also likely only be looking at one type of waste, like that of physical materials, but might be very energy intensive or labor intensive. Zero stratification likely means there's a very, very bad case of tall poppy syndrome. You want people to stand out just in different ways. We've got a bunch of different intelligence types like linguistic, logical, spatial, musical, kinesthetic, inter and intrapersonal, existential, and even naturalistic. People should be able to use their skills in useful ways, but at different times in humanity's development, different skills are more important. Farming and working with your hands used to be very important, whereas with the rise of YouTube and social media, education and entertainment is becoming more revered. Engineering is likely to be important in the early days on Mars, but maybe when we start doing long space flight to the asteroid belt, the ability to do spacewalks and withstand lots of long trips in nearly zero G will matter more. The point is, if we have things of societal importance, some projects or goals, then we'll have some sort of a reward function on those things that matter. We'll reward those people more and direct more resources towards certain skills, and there will be stratification. If you don't reward people, you aren't incentivizing them, and you end up without focus. But the rewards shouldn't be the necessities of life. Those should be a given. When I talk about violence, I want to clarify that I'm mostly referring to physical harm. Unfortunately, there's been a push to expand the meaning to include even small emotional harm. But we can't completely smooth out life, and we shouldn't. We need adversity in order to make us stronger. Our society also needs to be able to do things like demolish old buildings, especially if it's to make way for a new amazing arcology. You might be sad that your old childhood home is no longer there and feel some emotional loss, but it's part of the creative destruction that comes with the ever-changing nature of the universe, which is covered more in Tower Number 5, dynamic equilibrium. Hopefully, some of this meta-analysis on the Tau points helps give a better view on them. Let me know at AbundantMars.com 
or any main social media site for the podcast if you have any further analysis and thoughts. John's story. John is sitting in the cafeteria, looking at his phone, working. He works in food distribution, making sure the food that's been harvested is then processed, cooked, stored, or composted correctly. His main well-known feature is the always fresh food bowl. He set up a regular rotation of the apples, bananas, grapes, and other fruits so that after being automatically picked by a robot, a select set would be ripened, then transported to the people's fruit bowls in their rooms or the cafeteria. If uneaten for a while, then before the fruit would go off, they would be replaced with new fruits, and the old ones would be used to make things like cakes, shakes, or jams. If people never ate the fruits, then eventually those fruit bowls would stop being filled. Thankfully, having a great transport system and robot arms inside people's dining room made this possible. Apart from projects like that, it's actually a pretty easy job given how automated it is. John is mostly needed for the weird edge cases. In an abundance-centered society, people get food according to their biological requirements. For example, if you have more muscles or are more active, you need more calories. If you are pregnant, you need some special vitamins. The aquaponic systems need to be sized to make enough food for the people who are on the base, the new people who are arriving from Earth, the people returning to Earth, and also have enough slack in case of various failures. So, you also want fairly full food stocks. On Mars, most people have fortnightly blood tests to ensure they have enough vitamins and minerals, and they aren't losing too much muscle or bone through atrophy because of the lower gravity. Their watch acts as an activity monitor, and those who are at risk often have daily eye blood testing whereby a specialised camera can view the blood at the back of your eye to get things like an approximate blood count and also to look for certain disease markers. Your dietary macros and micros are worked out regularly and most people will order food for the next day so there's plenty of time for the system to prepare it. When you go to order food, the digital menu is organised with some competing priorities. There's both what types of food you like, what will be the easiest to meet your nutritional requirements, as well as what the food availability is, like if it's in surplus, in frozen storage, or if some of the ingredients just aren't available anymore. This means that the menu you can order from is different based on the current availability, although there's a lot of work done to keep a select set of foods always available. Thankfully, there's a fairly regular cadence of food expectations. You know how many people there are and how many serves of grains, meat, fruits and veggies are going to be needed in aggregate. Things like apples, oranges, bananas, grapes, plus potatoes, tomatoes, lettuce and cucumber. They recently added mangoes, pineapples and avocados, which after some years have finally grown up enough to be productive and have added a nice sweet or creamy texture, unlocking new recipes. The food is grown in large vertical farming systems, which are a bunch of hermetically sealed rooms. There's a lot of control over the light levels, water, nutrients, and other aspects. This allows the horticulturalists to have batches of food become ripened at different times throughout the year. This reduces the variability over when the fruits are produced. Instead of a lot being available only for a short harvesting period a couple of times a year, the artificial seasons are offset in different batches, so there's at least a set of each main food group ripening each month. It also helps that they use bees for pollination. They also grow grain foods. These are wheat, soybeans, and some barley, rye, and sugarcane. These are grown in what's basically brightly lit but barely tall enough to stand in warehouses with thin soil. For the plants to grow, they need the carbon from the atmosphere. They are great CO2 scrubbers that way, combining the carbon 
with the hydrogen from water to make starches and glucose. So the vast majority of their mass comes from the water and air. But they also need other nutrients like nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and others. This is the equivalent of vitamins for us. The air and water circulations do the heavy lifting. In fact, most plant rooms have extra high CO2 levels. However, there is a lot of complexity in actually providing the extra nutrients. There's a four-way system for those inputs. The wastewater system provides the largest input stream, with the combined composting, chickens and aquaponic systems helping with the rest. The wastewater system helps close the primary loop. People eat food, they can't absorb all the materials, and pass some of it out. The toilets are hooked up to the wastewater system, which takes the excrement and puts it into big, highly aerated vats full of bacteria. The bacteria eat the poop and turn it into something more biologically safe. The bacterial sludge is then scraped from the bottom, killed off, blended, and then fed into the hydroponics water system. But there's excess sources of biological nutrients. This includes food waste from cooking, or people not eating everything, and also plant matter left over from the production of things like coffee, rubber, cooking oils, and organic hydrocarbons. A lot of that can be dealt with using composting, by putting food scraps in and having it turn into soil. You have to get the mixture of nitrogen to carbon somewhat right, but it's made much faster using worms. This system is extra sped up by the use of chickens, which can also eat a lot of the food scraps and turn them into eggs and poop. But there's also a need for fish in the aquaponic system, which are fed things like the wheat and soybean chaff, plus some of the processed food scraps and compost materials. These fish help produce ammonia for the plants. Ammonia, or especially the nitrate it's turned into by some more bacterial processes in their water, is a great source of nitrogen for the plants. All of these systems together means there's very little that escapes the biological nutrient cycle. Once matter enters the cycle, it just needs energy to keep it flowing through and thus keeping people well fed. The system has to keep increasing in size and has large demand spikes when people arrive from Earth. But there's usually a 5-9 to nine month lead time on new arrivals and you know exactly how many people are coming. Still, sometimes there's unexpected spikes in supply or demand. Unfortunately, now is one of those unexpected times. John learns about what happened. John's phone rings. He picks it up. Hi, Caroline. What's up? He asked with a smile on his face. Caroline started bawling her eyes out, sobbing. They're gone! John said, Okay, Caroline, t- take a deep breath and tell me again. What happened and who is gone? I'm sorry, John. They're dead. So many of them. dead. John is getting rather worried. Who died? Oh my god, did a meteor hit a part of the base and he wasn't notified? He gets a spike of adrenaline, his heart starts to race, and he's starting to sweat. Caroline cries for a few more moments before blowing her nose. (sighs) John has to move the phone away from his ear. When he moves it back, he can hear her talking like she's regained her composure. The filters were getting clogged. All the time, the, the water was really murky. You, you could barely see anything. So we, we purged the T2 aquaponic system and sent the robots in to, to clean it out. It, it all worked as, as expected, but, you know, it, it's a big system. It's our, our biggest aquaponic setup. <sighs> as she stopped to breathe, John was screaming inside his head, Who died? How many people? How could the aquaponics system kill people? But he patiently waited. Caroline continued, We needed fresh water, not the muck that was there before. So we tapped what was in the large emergency storage tank. I mean, it was all going to get sent back to the wastewater treatment plant anyway. But there's an issue. 
the tower is above the ground. I, I didn't realize. It, it's rather cold and, well, they only keep the water to four degrees. It's, it's just enough to keep the water from freezing. But that's too cold. They died. <laughs> Nearly all of them. John had already started running for the aquaponics section of the base. He kept waiting for her to explain how something broke and the place flooded, or some electrical system fried people. He kept expecting to see some base-wide alert show up. His friends' faces were flashing in front of his eyes, alternating between smiling and dying in pain. John couldn't contain it. What? I, I don't understand. What, what, ha- what happened? Who died, Caroline? Caroline sobered up, realizing what she'd done, and replied, Oh, oh, no one died. It, it was the fish. All our fish died. She started to whimper again as she explained, The water was too cold for them. They died of thermal shock. When I looked at the input water temperature, it said it was fine. But of course, that's right by the door, not deep in the water tower. I mean, why didn't I think about it? Why didn't I check the water temperature again before introducing them? It's my fault. Then Caroline blew her nose again. John stopped running and his brain switched gears. Oh, it wasn't people who died. His friends were all okay. It was the fish. The T2 system was their biggest many times larger than all of the others combined. John asked, Caroline, how many fish are we talking about? She replied, Um, let me think. We had to put them into a bunch of holding tanks before we refilled the system. They were pretty crammed in there, but if I remove some weight for the water... I think about 754 tons worth? John gasped. Oh, 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 that's a lot. Caroline replied, yeah, I'm sorry. And now we don't know where to put them. The system says long-term food storage can't take it all. Can't even get it in there fast enough. Can you help with that? Before John could form a response, he could hear someone talking to her in the background. Hey, I've got to go. And she hung up. John immediately switched to the food distribution section of the resource engine app. There was normally only fish being added when they died off from old age, maybe a few hundred kilograms a day. He could see that they would easily overwhelm the five tons available in the base's active reserves, that is, the food waiting to be immediately cooked and eaten. He put the highest priority on eating fish, For the next few weeks, fish was going to be the primary food item on the menu. Over the next few hours, he managed to survey the situation. There was a large mass of dead fish in the aquaponic system, mostly a large set of tanks which fed water into the primary grain and hydroponic fruits and veggies. There were some automated systems for detecting and gathering fish in what are essentially giant aquariums. Usually, the fish either floated or sometimes sunk, but the systems simply weren't designed for this level of load. They could carry out no more than one tonne of fish per hour. It would take a month just to remove the dead fish from the tanks using the existing system. Thankfully, they could fairly easily fill up the holding tanks again, but now with the dead fish. It was pretty obvious what the best course of action was after that. Number one, try to eat as many fish as possible. Number two, store as many fish as possible. And number three, process the rest of the fish into fish food or as composting feed. Freezing the fish was easy in theory. You just could put them in a storage warehouse that's not very well thermally insulated. It's minus 60 degrees outside at the moment. But the Martian dust is toxic and clingy, so you can't just leave them outside like in Antarctica. It also sometimes gets above 20 degrees outside, so you need to keep them in a thermally regulated, partly pressurised, frozen storage space. 
We also want to keep as much heat as possible inside the base. So ideally, you'd want to use a heat pump to freeze the fish first and use that heat for the new water. However, the frozen food stores are usually kept as full as possible and there wasn't easily a 700 meter cubed or nearly 9 by 9 by 9 meter area available. That's the size of a two-story building on Earth. Basically, they couldn't store it nor freeze it fast enough. But they could probably store 50% of it, at least as frozen. To even get them there, it would require a massive effort to drain most of the water again and then have a continuous stream of robots filling up buckets full of fish and taking them to be frozen. John's mind was racing. He'd already messaged Andy about programming the robots and Caroline about the holding tanks. He was now bringing more people into a group chat, seeing if anyone else on the base had some good ways of storing them. He talked to Caroline and suggested that they keep the water from getting warm even if that means having to keep a stream of cold water over the fish, that would reduce the chances of them going off. The Mars base currently had provisions for up to 5 tonnes of fish to be in short-term storage. This is where the fish which had just died would be kept in a standing tank before being selected, cooked and eaten. Eating lots of fish was fine for most people, as there wasn't many forms of meat. It was mostly fish or the occasional chicken. It's not normally a problem because there was plenty of protein in the veggies. Some people were vegetarian and vegan and they wouldn't even see fish as a food option. But for everyone else, they already had to scroll quite far down in the menu app before seeing anything else but something with a serving of salmon, tuna, sardines, tilapia or some other fish food menu item. The group of them worked together and released a notice to the rest of the base, letting everyone know what happened. Someone pointed out that if it was an excess of fruits, they could be turned into jam. So maybe they could set up some sort of preservation and tinning equipment for having dried or tinned fish. It looks like they'd be able to have tinned tuna and sardines that could last years, although it would take weeks to spin things up properly but they could start drying out lots of the fish now if they used some of the excess heat from the iron forge, and they needed some metal anyway for the fish that they couldn't dry. Overall, they would be able to preserve 250 tonnes worth. Some of the fish would spoil, but they could be made into a paste and given to the new fish which would be introduced into the system from those other aquaponic systems. That is, after the T2 system was properly refilled with nicely reheated water. Overall, it was not too bad. John and the others managed to make the most of a bad situation. There had been an increase in fish bones stuck in people's teeth, but that was about it. There's also now a thermometer placed closer to the centre of water tanks, rooms and other places. And an estimated average temperature is shown. This is especially important where there's a large temperature gradient, not just in tanks which are outside of the normal heated zone of the base, but also rooms which have been deactivated and aren't heated nor pressurised in order to save energy. There's also alarms set up properly now for the main aquarium water to prevent that from happening again. John's Capitalism Story Under capitalism, John is working for the Rossum Food Corporation and is their main point man. He is the manager in charge. He gets a message from Caroline. Urgent. The T2 fish are dead. John heads over and takes some photos and gets the details from Caroline. He's already drafted a message for the corporation back on Earth. It'll be 18 minutes before they even get the message. Apart from checking that the dead fish extractor was working, they just waited idly for what ended up being over two hours. The email response was professional, but not pleasant. Dear John Denver Jr. Regarding your email titled Dead Fish in T2, we would like to remind you that the Rossum Food Corporation is trying to poise itself as catering to the upper middle class 
and has recently had to compete with companies offering force-fed ducks livers or fish eggs. These competitors have recently reduced their price offerings and started aggressive marketing, as you yourself have previously highlighted to us. Thankfully, they are still many times the price of our fish offering. However, Rossum does not want to get pushed into a lower tier market. We want to maintain our $150 per kilogram price point. We have discussed the options and investigated the price of long-term storage, composting, and equipment hire. Given the current rate of food consumption, we have calculated an optimal outcome which will prevent us from flooding the market with cheap fish, whilst not costing us a lot to dispose of the rest. As such, you are ordered to do the following. Number one, fill up the Martian base's short-term food reserves. We understand this should be capable of at least five tons and is a part of our free allocation. However, don't reduce the price. Number two, put 52 tons of fish into long-term storage. We've secured a contract with the Mars storage facility and they should be reaching out to you shortly to organize logistics. Number three, Fire Caroline immediately. Her incompetence has cost the company over $100 million in lost potential revenue. This is unacceptable. As per Martian rules, we've released enough funds from escrow so she can buy a ticket back to Earth. But she won't receive a paycheck for the current month. We are currently investigating if we can sue her in court. Number four. We have credited your personal account with enough to cover hiring a Martian digger in a large transport truck for one hour. You are to contact the number provided and ask for Joe. You are then to take the digger to a spot over the horizon, away from the view of the base, and dig a large enough hole to put the remaining fish into, then cover them up. We estimate this will take more than one hour, and you will have to use your personal account to cover the remaining costs. You are the person in charge, and this happened under your watch. Signed, the Rossum Food Corporation. John read the email and sighed. (sighs) He showed Caroline the email, and she started to cry. But how will I survive? She whimpers. I've only got enough savings for a month, not a year. After a few moments, she starts to get angry and says, It's expensive to live here. Ten times the cost of living in New York. So either I die of starvation, homeless on Mars, in the next few months, or I can't afford the flight back and die of starvation, homeless on Mars. John said, maybe you can get another job here? Caroline chuckled in amused anger. Have you ever heard of someone getting a job on Mars? You get assigned a job, train for a year or more, and then go to Mars. They also have a backup for your role in case you die during your tour. Nope, I don't think I can survive. All because of some stupid gauge that didn't tell me it was freezing cold water. She stormed off. John contacted Joe and got suited up, ready for a walk outside. It was many hours later when he returned. Despite using a mining hauler, he had to do seven trips in the truck. There was no way the mound would be invisible, but he was guessing no one would question it, at least for a while. That night, John rocked up at Caroline's place, rolling a large barrel there. She looked confused and then opened the door. Look, Caroline, I don't think it's right what they did to you, nor what they just made me do. I can't go against their wishes, so don't tell them I helped you. But here's some fish. You should be able to last another couple of months just off these and some cheap veggies. You are a smart, capable woman. I'm sure you'll be able to land another job in the meantime, said John. Thank you, John. Thank you, she replied and Caroline's stress seemed to melt away from her. She was so relieved. But the story wasn't over. 
they had just taken out a large amount of biological nutrients from the system, and it would cause intermittent cascading failures. Over the coming months, it would be hard for the vertical farms to get enough nutrients. The fish stocks never recuperated fully, and the prices of food increased. Those on minimum wage were put under even more financial and physical stress, and they could barely sustain themselves. But the Rossum Food Corporation were happy, because being a piece of critical infrastructure, they managed to get financial compensation from the government for much of their potential losses. That also chased away the competitors who had to raise their prices as their food stocks also diminished. John's story and I'll reiterate the short version before finishing up. The core tenets of an abundant centered society are number one, an abundance mindset, creating abundance through cradle to cradle, systems design, access abundance, and automation. Number two, being responsibility based. You should look after the systems that support you and your fellows. Number three, production target. Try to reduce needless waste, violence, and stratification. Number four, the scientific method. We want to pursue abundant knowledge, but apply it ethically. Number five, dynamic equilibrium. We should expect change just as our universe is always changing. Number six, dataism. With enough data, we can have previous examples to go on and select the best course of action, even if it goes against our instincts and emotions. This is the next stage beyond humanism. Number seven, integral. This is about understanding yourself and how to reason in order to increase your personal sense making. This includes psychometric profiling systems like the ocean model and spiral dynamics integral. Number eight, intelligence quadrant. Try to be in the intelligence quadrant where you do things that are good for you and good for others. Number nine, collective sense making. This is about taking your perspectives and merging them with others to better understand an issue. It's also about trying to expand empathy towards all living things. Number 10, collective decision-making. This is about selecting the best decision-making framework and synthesizing the best decisions given the constraints. Number 11 and 12 are bonus towels for you to work out, either individually or collectively in the future. Outro. Some random facts about me. Conceived in Australia, born in England to British and German parents, I grew up in Australia and am now living in the Philippines. I have travelled through Europe, America and Southeast Asia. I've gone to seven schools and two universities, although never completed a degree, but I've got a lifelong passion for learning. Needless to say, I have a lot of lived experiences with a variety of cultural perspectives. I've been playing a lot of Occupy Mars recently, which is similar to the type of game I'd love to create for simulating Mars survival. For this month's recommendation, I want to suggest Cradle to Cradle, the book, the movie, and the way of building things. I love the book, which is titled Cradle to Cradle, Remaking the Way We Make Things, which was written by architect William McDonough and chemist Michael Braungart and came out in 2002. I've got a physical copy, and it's not made of paper, but a synthetic polymer. I'd also like to recommend the Game B people, including Daniel Schmackenberger and Jordan Hall. They've created some really good content regarding collective sense-making, which was on the Rebel Wisdom YouTube channel. But there's also some newer content on other channels. Those two are especially at the forefront of civilization-defining philosophy and thought. Hopefully they and yourself can review this podcast episode and find some flaws with my thinking so that I can update the Tower of Aces with even better solutions in later episodes. 
next episode should explain towers 4, 5 and 6. Let's go for aces. Have a good one. Civilization advances by extending the number of operations we can perform without thinking about them. Alfred North Whitehead The Abundant Mars Podcast.